Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight's a pretty special night because we get to have two speakers. One, flies ultralights. And that's a pretty cool thing because ultralights were invented where? In Wisconsin. And if you've ever gone to the EAA up in Oshkosh, it's a pretty good place to see very fragile little craft in the air. And the second type of craft are ships, ships that sank in Lake Michigan. And to have these two types of things come together in one night is pretty special. So I'm going to start by introducing Tamara, who's the second speaker, and then we'll go to Susie, who's the first speaker. Tamara Thompson uh, was born in Bethesda, Maryland, and grew up in Carmel, Indiana, where she went to high school. She got her undergraduate degree here at UW-Madison in horticulture and her master's degree in genetics, and this is the Genetics Biotechnology Center building, which is, explains why she works with, for the Wisconsin Historical Society as a diver <laughs> in maritime archaeology. <laughs> Susie Johnson was born in Manitowoc and went to high school there. She came here to UW-Madison and then lived in Whitewater for a while and then returned to, uh, up that way by Manitowoc to Two Rivers and uh, ran a business there for about 37 years. She is an ultralight pilot. And tonight we get to hear about speeding maritime archaeology using ultralight aircraft. We're going to start off with Susie Johnson, please join me in welcoming Susie Johnson to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Good evening, everyone. When I first saw a powered parachute, I was driving along uh, the shore of Lake Michigan, and I looked up and I said, what is that thing? And I was just mesmerized. And I remember thinking, someday I want to ride on one of those. Well, little did I know, about three to four years later, I ended up working with a guy who owned one. And I would listen to his stories and just go, oh my goodness. And I was just, just mesmerized by the whole thing. Well, he took me up for a ride in a January. <laughs> yes, it is a little bit chilly, and if there is snow on the ground, we can put skis on, we can fly all year long. In fact, winter is the best time. And I loved it. He handed me a book, the Bible of the uh, powered parachute, and that was in January, and I was bound and determined to learn how to fly one. And there's a lot to learn, a lot to know, but by March, a month and a half later, I did my solo. And it was, it was a fantastic thing. There's a lot to know. You need to know how to set the chute out right so it flies up. There's a lot of gauges on the instrument paddle. You have to know what they're for, what their temperatures are. So there is a lot to know and remember. And when you first start flying, you've got to go through all of this head, keep it straight, and you really don't get to enjoy in the beginning what it's really all about. The more you fly and everything falls into place, you just, it's peace and serenity. It is just unbelievable. And I, I, I feel like I have gone to a psychiatrist for an hour after flying 10 minutes in the air. The plane itself weighs about 400 pounds. There's a um, 582 Rotex engine. It's 45 horsepower. And there's a 500 square foot chute. And there are, if you can see the black straps coming up, from the white plane, that is what holds that plane in the air. This is another one that I fly. It's a little bit smaller. This is the field that um, we take off from. It's about five miles from my house. It's a privately owned registered airfield called Woodland Field. It's 900 feet long and 600 feet wide. And this airfield is about a mile from the shore of Lake Michigan. This is taking off, getting ready to fly to the lake. And this is a city of two rivers. The, with the two rivers, the, the harbor is on 
your right hand side and then the two rivers split. This is a picture of the shoreline heading south along Lake Michigan. Uh, there is, it is an advantageous to fly the lake shore because you get a steady breeze off the lake and it's not as turbulent as inland. I have fly, flown many different terrains and the lake shore is still my favorite. And this is south. You, you can see if you look towards the shoreline, you can see the different sandbars. I fly, well we fly in the morning and the evening, that's when the winds are most favorable. My time to fly is, I would like early morning, it's just when things are waking up and the sun is coming up over the lake, it's, it's beautiful. And this is flying along the lake, if you can see that little thing that's perpendicular to the seaweed, and there is the Major Anderson. This is what started, this is the shipwreck that started the whole thing off. Uh, the conditions have to be really good or almost perfect to be able to see these in the water. The water needs to be clear, it needs to be calm, and hopefully there will be no ripple. A slight ripple is okay, but in order to find, to see these, the conditions have to be right. You can even see fish. I mean, you can count the fish, the number of fish in the schools when the conditions are right. This is one of the wrecks that um, Tamara and her team uh, identified in, in a, three ships uh, in one week. This is the lookout. And here's another picture of it. You can see where the shoreline is down in the corner, so it really isn't that far out. And this one is the Scow, Alaska, which is closer to shore a little bit. Uh, I think it's in about four feet of water. Yeah, so you could really, if the water were warm enough, you could walk out there to see it itself. And the Major Anderson was also, I think the bow was in like four feet of water. And I don't remember, oh, this, this is the lookout also. This is, a, this is what we see when we first see these boats in the water. This is taken at about, I would say, 500 feet in the air, and this one's in fairly deep water. So you're not sure if you're looking at a shipwreck or not. You take a picture and send it to Tamara and let her say, oh yeah, I think it is. <laughs> she has, she's been a lifesaver. <laughs> this is also a picture of the lookout, that little blob down in the left-hand corner. And these are two, a picture I took of two wrecks in one picture. This was taken two years ago and when Tamara first saw this, she goes, I've never seen these before. So there are two more out there that need to be identified. But it's really, with the way Mother Nature has been and the way the, the wind has moved all the sand on the beach, it's, it's going to be real surprising to see what it's going, um, if they're going to be uncovered again, or if their new ones are uncovered. So that's really all I have. It, it's been really eventful, and I have loved flying in. Tamara's been a big help with this, and it's really got me excited in the whole thing. And here we go, Tamara. <laughs> You're next. <laughs> you stay up here with me. You want to stay up here with me? You can sit here, and then if you want to, if you want to add anything into uh, into the conversation, then you can. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. <laughs> so my job is um, is to come back and explain what what it is that we uh, that Susie found and Mike found for us. Um, these are some really amazing shipwrecks and uh, really amazing finds. Um, the, as, as underwater archaeologists, we, we tend to hear about one shipwreck a year, maybe every two or three years. But uh, to have them continually find new shipwrecks is, is 
pretty amazing. And to, to, to have such enthusiasm for going out and looking. So, so my task now is to, to explain to you what it is they found and a little bit about the history and why these sites are so important. So of the five shipwrecks that we've looked at now, two of them are already listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And we've just last week turned in um, the applications for the remaining three that we um, that we looked at this summer. So all five we believe are, are very significant and um, explain a good part of um, our Wisconsin maritime history. So, and I want to take a quick second and talk to you about this region that they're looking in. So um, does everybody familiar with Raleigh Point? So Raleigh Point and Two Rivers, it's going to be the sort of the thumb that sticks out, the little nub that sticks out on the top end of the screen there. And um, if you see all of the um, yellow and red dots that are around there, those are all of the shipwrecks that Susie has notified us about. So this region. Um, in, uh, in October of last year, President Obama um, made the decision to go forward with a national marine sanctuary. So we're going through the process of designating this area. So the reason that this is qualified for that is because there are this is an area that contains um, a number of significant shipwrecks and they're really vital to our understanding of our history. In the area, there are, in this whole band here, which includes the three counties of, um, of Manitowoc, Sheboygan, and Ozaki County, there are 139 known vessel losses. So that's by historic newspaper reports and um, insurance documents, that type of thing. And of those, we only know where 38 of those are. So. Five of those are ones Susie has come forward with. So that's a pretty big chunk. And, um, and she's just flying Raleigh Point in that little area in there, and more and more keeps coming out of the sand. So in this area, too, there are 16 in total that are listed on the National Register. Again, two of those are Susie's. There are three that are going forward. They're somewhere in the process of either federal or state review, various stages. So, so those we'll see also. Also, um, come and have judgment on them as whether they could be listed in the very near future. So a good question is why do we have so many shipwrecks that are there? And um, it's really because we're along this major ship, it, ship shipping routes. So this was a, a way for um, the grain trade as the as the frontier moved west and we started developing farms and um, and produce was being produced here, grain in particular, in Milwaukee and Chicago. This was a very, very easy way for us to get that grain back to the eastern markets that were very hungry for this product. And then in return, a lot of these vessels came back carrying coal to fuel the factories. And, um, and then we also had this intra-lake trade as well. So um, the ships would stay just on Lake Michigan, and they would only do commerce within the, the individual lake. And so, so and I'll, when I get a little bit more into the history, you'll be able to pick those little things out. The other thing that we really, we really enjoy exploring when we're looking at all these shipwrecks is really the immigrant involvement in them. So, um, you know, a lot of times, these vessels were the entry point into the maritime trades. So uh, they would come here uh, from whatever country. They would begin work as a sailor. Maybe they had a background in it, or they had background as uh, as a shipbuilder, and they would continue those practices here. And um, and it was an easy way for them to get in and begin feeding their families right when they arrived here in Wisconsin. So we simply have to, and I remind this on every one of my presentations, to look only to our state seal, to know how important maritime is to our state. Um, we, see, we see, obviously, the sailor. We see the anchor. Anybody else know what the other, the other um, icon of maritime history is? The caulking mallet. All right, good, good one. Yeah, the Arm and Hammer was uh, was introduced to uh, represent prowess in maritime or er, in um, in uh, uh, industry, but that industry actually is is as shipbuilding because this is a very important tool that was integral to that trade. 
So let's start looking at some of the shipwrecks that uh, that Susie has reported to the state. And the first one started out with the Major Anderson. So the Major Anderson is right off of Molash Creek, which is at the um, southern end of Point Beach State Forest, if you're familiar with that, that area. And she's in about seven to 10 feet of water. So very reasonable depth if you're into snorkeling in Lake Michigan, burr, but, or kayaking. <laughs> um, we find that a lot of people like to come out and kayak this particular wreck. And um, Susie's daughter, Erin, works at uh, Point Beach State Forest, and um, I received an email through them saying that uh, there was, uh, that her mother had taken these pictures and uh, was wondering what it was she was looking at because she had this natural curiosity, as you probably have gained from her presentation. And, um, and she wanted to know what this was and if it was a shipwreck. So I can imagine her, what is this? I don't know what this is. So and they go back and forth nagging each other. And so she finally came forward and gave me this, this picture. And I'm like, yep, that's a shipwreck. Where was it? And she told me where it was. It's like, you know, there's nothing cataloged there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we don't know where everything is, obviously. So we, uh, so I uh, fit it into our schedule at the end of one of our, our surveys to go and take a look at it. And we put a tape measure down the middle of it. And um, we determined that it was 153 feet in length. And you try to, to try to do a little sleuthing to figure out, like, you know, which, which, one, which one's missing in this area that would fit this length that's like Cinderella. And, um, <laughs> and it ends up being one called the Major Anderson. So for our history fanatics in the audience, so most people, by the way, name their ship for their mother or you know their sister or you know it's an important person in, merit in uh, the maritime industry. But uh, I was I was curious. The ma na name Major Anderson rang a bell to me, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Does anyone know who Major Anderson is? Oh yeah, bring you back right to the, okay. This is um, he is the commander of Union forces when South Carolina seceded from the Union, and so he marched his troops to Fort Sumter and uh, held the fort for several months without provisions or reinforcements. And finally, um, on the 12th of April, 1861, 10,000 Confederate troops converged and uh, fired on the fort for 43 hours. And, um, and he finally succeed, or, uh, surrendered. And um, that's what began the Civil War or the War of Northern Aggression if you're from the southern states. And, um, and so, and I thought, well, that's really an odd name to name your ship, but you know, if you're a Union supporter, this ship was built in 1868, uh, maybe. And um, then I started looking into it, and there's actually four ships that were built on the Great Lakes that were all named Major Anderson. So it's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But this one was the biggest one of all of them. And, um, and, it, uh, and the owner was, uh, was very, very proud of his vessel. And so he commissioned a local artist to paint the Battle of Fort Sumner across the stern of the ship. And he flew the largest American flag that he could find, and he sailed into every port with it flying in the breeze. So um, you know, very, very strong, uh, fr a strong uh, Union supporter. And uh, so this particular vessel is also really unique to Wisconsin history because it is, um, it is a barkentine, so it's square rigged. So it'd be like kind of ocean rigged vessels were more typically square rigged, not Great Lakes uh, vessels. And so it would have looked pretty similar to this one. Um, so, and, uh, and we don't have very much evidence of these in Wisconsin waters. I think we know of two or three other ones. They're located you know, anywhere within our state. So the other thing that's really neat about this ship is that it, that brings us around to really the local history and telling the story of you know the lumber industry here and uh, why this ship was sailing here is when she sank she sank in October on October seventh, um, eighteen seventy one. Does anybody ring a bell with that one? Yes. Y yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, the captain got lost in a fog over Lake Michigan, so there's a lot of smoke. There were these regional fires that were burning everywhere here. So, and um, on the 7th of October, uh, the captain became lost and ran aground uh, south of Raleigh, what's now Raleigh Point or Two Rivers Point, and, um, and grounded there. And so it very did not look anything like this picture 
out on the lake. So it would have been very, very <laughs> foggy and smoky. And so, yeah, but, um, but it's an interesting rendition. Now, kind of an interesting tie to the Chicago fire is that, um, so this went around on the 7th. The Great Chicago Fire started on the 8th. And the owner was living in Chicago at the time, and he had um, a wharf. And um, on the, when he heard that, the, that his vessel had become stranded, he put a pump aboard the, a tug, and he sent the tug up to two rivers to try to remove his vessel. And that saved the pump and the tug because his wharf completely was demolished by this fire. So kind of interesting thing. Um, and um, so when we go and we look at, I'll take, take you down to the shipwreck. So the reason that they couldn't get it out and they couldn't work with, uh, get the pump to work is that um, it was so stuck in the bottom. It was, they claimed that it was stuck in quicksand. And I was like, oh yeah, what, what's quicksand really? You know, it's, it, it kind of sounds like something that maybe, you know, Bugs Bunny stuck in quicksand. Uh, but no, this was, and so we, uh, we went out and we started to survey this. And as you're kneeling on the bottom and you're taking measurements, you literally sink into your waist. And if you touch the shipwreck, it moves like it's in jelly. And um, so it's kind of crazy. So you have to be very, very careful not to move sediment around. And so unfortunately, I don't have very good pictures because you know, if, we, if you get down there and you just look at the shipwreck, it obliterates the visibility. So Susie has the best view of these shipwrecks. <laughs> when you're underwater, it's, it's not so great. So the other thing that's really cool that I think about this shipwreck, and I'm going to geek out on maritime archaeology for you here, is um, this little door that's in the side here. This is, um, this is what's called a lumber port. So they were only on the starboard sides of the vessels. And so this was used as they pulled up to the lumber pier that they could put the dimensional lumber into the hold of the ship more easily than coming in through the top through the cargo hatches. So I think this is really cool. It's iron framed and it's got some decorative work that's done on it. It's got pins on the inside. So I then started looking at all of these other vessels that we had looked at that had been involved in the lumber industry to go back and try to figure out if they had had lumber ports and compare them. And yeah, so that's kind of one of those little geeky things. The other thing that was really cool is that a few months later, Aaron sent me this picture. Okay, so again, they couldn't get the ship out because they had sent the pump up and they had such strong uh, storm conditions on the site that they only really got to work on the vessel for a little bit and they struggled because it was stuck in sand. But they also lost the pump. Here's the pump. So it's um, it's at the or the boiler for it. It's actually up on the beach. So right, uh, if you decide to walk the beach at Point Beach State Forest, you likely will run into this um, top of the boiler. And um, sometimes it's in waist deep water. Sometimes you can walk to it. Here it's surrounded by ice. And so it's it's kind of a, one of those unique features that you can tie together, uh, you know, amongst the landscape that's there. This is what the Major Anderson looks like. So she was again quite big for for a schooner. And um, and the stern at the time of my of the survey of this was covered um, when we went back out there this summer I'm, I'm pointing at Caitlin Zant the other uh, maritime archaeologist of the Wisconsin Historical Society waving and um, so when we went out this summer the the stern had become uncovered a little bit but the transom was not um, exposed and so I just can imagine that if that thing's been buried in this quicksand for that long there just might be some remnants of that mural <laughs> that was painted on the stern so that's like that's my little dream that's that's out there so we go back year after year and again it's um it's one of those uh, very popular sites for um for kayakers now um just you know and Susie found this in 2013 and now it's become this thing to go to which is great and uh, I don't know if you can see this it's it's kind of hard with the lighting in here but the um but you can see the bow and then the the kayakers over we ran into those kayakers out there and they were going in circles and they it's like what are you guys doing and it's like we're surveying the shipwreck over here and they said and they said well we're looking for this other and so I drove them down to it and said, follow us. We had a powered boat, of course, and um, they followed us down to it. So, okay, so during, so that was, um, that was the, uh, we heard about this in 2013. Um, I went out and surveyed it. It was listed on the National Register in October of 2014. And um, I think right about that time, I received another email uh, from Aaron. 
And uh, it had this picture in it, and it said, I don't think I ever sent you this. Um, I think this is something my mom took this fall. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. So <laughs> we're trying to figure out, I'm like, where is this? There's you know, not a whole lot of land references. Went back and started talking um, a little bit. I think we chatted by email then about it. And um, turns out that this is the Pathfinder, okay? So this is, a, this is a schooner. It was a known site, so this one was listed. But it had been covered with sand for a number of years and people were not going to it. The, I mean, and so all of the sand has moved out. And if you live on the shoreline or you've been to the shoreline, you know there's quite a bit of erosion that's happening. So in 2013, we had um, a record low or near record low on Lake Michigan. And, um, and then the next year in 2014, it came up to normal. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a slow recovery. It was a really fast recovery that happened. And so what happens is, is that if you, you know, if you stand on the, the, the edge of um, a beach and you look and then there's a sandbar that's out and then there's another sandbar that's out there and if you lower the water level those sandbars move out um, you know comparatively to so they, they continue to move as well and um, and so this is really causing a lot of shoreline erosion but it's also causing um, a lot of shipwrecks to either be exposed or covered and um, and so there's always changes it's like surprise you know what we're gonna get this year and um, and so we took advantage and so Gail Orner who's back in the back raise your hand Gail um, and uh, Caitlin and I went out to this um, la uh, summer before last and um, we spent uh, four and a half hours and we surveyed the whole thing and you see Caitlin here on the bow she's um, she's uh, uh, wearing a rebreather so it's sort of a recirculating device so what it does is it as you exhale and you exhale carbon dioxide it goes into this chemical um, and that removes the carbon dioxide and it has an, an injection system that puts oxygen back in and it, you can stay down for about four and a half hours and that's your limit so it's pretty funny because we had this um, this guy that lives um, in one of the cottages that's just on shore from here it's maybe I don't know 400 feet um, to the shoreline and um, he had a skin canoe and um, and so and he put in and he he, canoe, he or, or sorry it was a kayak skin kayak and he came out and um, uh, he uh, kind of circled around and I guess he came out two or three times while we were there because we were down underwater for a very long time and most scuba divers will stay for like you know, 30 minutes get their fill and leave but we were actually doing work and we were trying to get it done we had one day to do it so um, and um, and so we can't we finally when we came back out he put in again and he came out to see us and he was like oh thank god he said I kept coming out and circling around and you I couldn't see any bubbles well this thing doesn't produce bubbles so because remember it's it's in, it's in closed system and, um, and uh, he was like I was worried about you but then you were moving so I thought it was okay so <laughs> a really nice guy and you know he looks after the resource which is great but one of the really really cool things about this particular shipwreck is um, it's it's 188 feet in length so it's a little bit longer it's kind of starting to move to these very gigantic wooden vessels and they end up having problems with longitudinal strength on these. And so if you look at the top one, this is what your normal um uh, normal ship would look like you'd have just a keel, uh, a keel with a floor on top of it to so the bottom of the ship, and then a keelson to provide longitudinal strength. And as it gets bigger, you start stacking timbers on either side and the top. And then by the time you get to really big and really kind of the extent of what you can do for wood um, in this kind of uh, longitudinal strengthening method to get down in the lower corner, and that's what we actually have on the Pathfinder. So if you see on the far right side of the screen that's like six timbers that are stacked up and this takes up a huge amount of room within the hold of the vessel so it's actually um, it's actually counterproductive to um, to putting cargo in it the other thing that we see that's really interesting is that they switched it over to the iron ore trade so and um, and actually sunk with a cargo of iron ore in um, in November of 1886 and um, you can see that the um, the frames that are like the ribs of the vessel um, are there's actually normally there's like you know one or two, you know, two uh, pieces of, of lumber that go, or timbers that go with them and here there's like four and five so they were very much strengthening the ship in order to survive the weight of the iron ore that they were putting in this to carry. 
Um, the other thing that's really kind of cool is that it has a brass gudgeon. And a lot of these shipwrecks that are this shallow has a lot of stuff taken off of it, salvaged or, you know, looted. And, um, and this still has that gudgeon in place. So if you see just to the right of the, um, or sorry, to the, to the left of the, um, uh, of the tape measure, that would have been where the bottom of the rudder would have been held in place. So that's, that's pretty cool. So and this is um, our drawing of, uh, of the Pathfinder and what's left. And we believe that there's quite a bit still that's left under the sand. I mean, it was, again, lost in quicksand, so they couldn't recover this. So it began to ice up. They, um, they parted the lines, it drifted ashore, and then they, when they reconnected and tried to pull it free, they couldn't because of this quicksand that was there. And this is another one where it's, it's huge, just this massive thing on the bottom, and you touch it and it wiggles around. So it's a little creepy, and again, we're, we're kind of sinking into this, uh, this bottom substrate as, um, as we're doing the survey of, of the ship. Okay, so now let's get to this year. So this year, it just got a little out of hand, Susie. So <laughs> she, you know, one, one drizzled in now and again is easy to accommodate, but three, wow. So, and we thought, uh, you know, three is like an awful lot. I'm not sure, you know, our program is grant funded. We have to sort of beg, borrow, and steal to be able to do this sort of external work. You know, it's, we, and, it's one of those priorities that you have to make because again, the bottom and the sand is changing so much that when these things are exposed, you really have to go and, and get the information because after the next storm, which may be tomorrow, this thing's gonna be covered up or will have changed. And so it's very, very important to, to get the information while you can. So I'm not sure, can you see, can everybody find the shipwreck in here? It looks like a little amoeba in the middle. Yeah, so this is like what she sees when she's flying. And like, I mean, it's like, this is my friend Susie. She sees things. Yeah, so <laughs> if you squint and use your imagination, maybe you can see a shipwreck in this picture. But yeah, it's actually, she'll send this to me. I'm like, oh, Mike and I went flying. Look what we found. And I'm like, is this a shipwreck? I'm like, yeah, that's a shipwreck. That's definitely a shipwreck. So you can see the, um, the uh, rows of Cladophora, so that uh, natural algae that's in Lake Michigan that are kind of stacked up along the ridges of the sandbars as you go out from the beach to so the beaches in the lower right-hand corner. And um, as you work your way out, you see the shipwreck. And um, you can see that the Cladophora has sort of built up around that. And that's what causes that sort of halo that you see from, uh, from above. And, um, and so again, we can't, it doesn't look like this when we're underwater. This is like, you know, I mean, it's not. <laughs> so you know, it's really, really difficult to see things. So the better way to look at it really is with like a side scan sonar. And so we got ourselves um, one of the hummingbird side scans, which is one of the little cool thing gadgets that you can have now on a boat. And you can really see the outline of the hull here and you can actually see the frames sticking up in the lower part of the image. So we, we uh, spent um, our morning dive working on this and there were a bunch of volunteers. One was Matt Schultz who um, Tom talked about earlier and um, and Gail and another uh, another um, gentleman named uh, George Mayhew, and um, we surveyed the shipwreck. This is the only picture I was able to get of it because as soon as everybody else got down there, it just it, this this silty sandy stuff suspended up in the water. And all these guys are cave divers, so they're really good divers. But it's your movement across the water is enough to bring the um, the bottom up sort of in a venturi behind you and um, and it just wipes it completely out. So we did a lot of this survey by feel. Um, and um, when we uh, started looking at, uh, again, we put a tape measure on it, we measured it, and um, we figured out what the losses were in, the, in this vicinity. And it was um, 126 feet long. And the only one that was south of the point that we had within the inventory of known lost vessels is the lookout. And um, this was built in 1855 in Buffalo, New York. And um, it sailed for 42 years. So it's like a extraordinarily long for a wooden ship. And um, sank in 1897. Um, they, um, 
<clears throat> sorry, they, uh, they came aground, uh, again, uh, uh, error in navigation by the captain, and um, they were sailing a little bit too close to the point, and they came aground here. And um, they, they, uh, they sat here until the morning, so this was, um, this was in, I think it was in May, and uh, they came aground at night. They sat here until morning, about, they'd set off no distress signals. Um, it was blowing a gale. Um, the Coast Guard or the Life Saving S Service um, patrol was out on the beach and he noticed this ship grounded and, um, and so this was five o'clock in the morning. So he sprinted five miles back to the station and got everyone up and by 6.10 they had gotten a team of horses and they were trying to drag their breeches gun up the beach and uh, the guys had taken to the rigging, the sailors. And so they had lashed themselves into the rigging and they had waited all night. And they see these guys slowly working their way up the beach and it gets to be about seven o'clock in the morning and they can't wait any longer. And so they launched their boat and, uh, and they came, they were able to bring themselves ashore, but uh, all of them were completely drenched and wet just at about 7.30 when the life-saving station arrived. So they took them back to the life-saving station, they fed them for a day and then sent them on their way. So they uh, determined that the ship was so badly damaged that they salvaged her anchors and some of her rigging and then left her there. And, um, and that's why that's why we, we see her now. And so we surveyed uh, the ship. You see that most of the starboard side is present, um, but the port side is missing. And we believe that that's um, under the sand. Um, so uh, probably another storm event or two, and, um, and we'll be able to get a little bit more, be able to add to this drawing. Okay, so then the next picture she sends me is, um, is this vessel. Does everybody see that in the center? She says, I found a square thing. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I don't know if it's a shipwreck. And um, I said, well, yes, Susie, it is a square thing. It's, um, it, it's probably a scow schooner. So scow schooners were square things. So they had, um, they had a very square bow, very square stern. Um, there was this adage that um, if you could build a barn, you could build a scow. And, um, and so it, it took you know, very little ship uh, Reitzman skills to be able to put one of these things together and so it was really the entry point in the maritime trade for an awful lot of immigrants. So we know that this vessel was built, this, um, this one ends up being the Scow Schooner Alaska. She was built in um, in uh, 1869 in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. So and um, she was built for a gentleman named Adolf Hawker. Okay, and um, he, he um, kept the vessel for one year, and in the spring of 1870, I found, a, I found a suit against him that was put forth by Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, and, it, um, and he lost, and it caused him to, we don't, I don't know the circumstances behind it because I haven't been able to find the, the exact case. This is all very new, because remember, we, we, uh, we looked at this just this summer, so we're trying to like quickly write the history with no money. <laughs> Um, and so we're so I found this this case and um, we looked at it and uh, it said that he had to sell the vessel right away and he ended up selling it to um, a gentleman named uh, Frederick Vogel and uh, Vogel was a partner with um, in Fister Vogel Leather Company out of Milwaukee and he used the vessel for uh, bringing lumber into Milwaukee. He kept the vessel for three years. He ended up selling it on to new, uh, newly arrived Norwegian immigrants. Um, they sailed it for three more years and um, in a storm they came aground north of Raleigh Point. Um, now when they, when they came aground they, they tried to hire two different wrecking companies, two different salvage companies to come and get them free. One one came for 10 days. They couldn't get them free because they were stuck in quicksand. Um, and, uh, and then, so then they hired another outfit to come up and they were there for eight days. Again, they could not get them free. So they're racking up bills. These guys are new immigrants. And the U.S. Marshal comes in and seizes the vessel because their bills are too high and um, does a fire sale on the, on the vessel. Um, it becomes the property of a gentleman named Captain Matheson out of Chicago. He then hires, he says, well, these salvage companies don't know what they're doing. So he goes into Manitowoc and he, there's a guy there that's a house mover. 
And so again, if you can build a scow, you can build a barn. So if you're gonna move a barn, you hire a house mover. So named Ella Cohn, and Ella comes out there, picks it up, puts it on the beach. And they spend the next two years trying to make the vessel seaworthy. And then they try to relaunch it and, and it fails miserably and they abandon the ship and, um, and it, um, it ends up floating around the point and comes to rest here. So in case you're wondering what a scow schooner looks like, we have uh, two scow schooners that are in this picture of Milwaukee Harbor at Lumber Pier. So you can see them in the, in the bottom uh, of the screen. So you can see that they're, they don't have that beautiful sort of um, wine glass cut water um, of uh, normal, uh, normal schooners that you would think of. They are square, like Susie said, there's something square. <laughs> so this one is very close to the beach. And again, it makes for a very, very nice um, uh, uh, kayak. So we've seen a lot of, a couple people come out while we were there trying to look at it. I don't know if you can see, there are four divers that are that are underwater in this um, in this picture. If you can count, count, find the divers, that's like, where's Waldo? And, <laughs> and they're all working underwater. So I'm like sitting on the boat and I'm um, getting a suntan at this point, I guess. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Caitlin and Matt uh, drawing to scale. We draw to scale. We do what's called um, uh, phase two archaeological survey. So, we um, document everything in place. We do no recovery. Um, what's very interesting about this is that the chain, um, the chain goes out and under the sand. And, uh, well, it's not really sand. It's sort of this gelatinous stuff. And um, as you follow it out, we followed it out for quite a while. And um, we could not find the end to it. So, there might be an anchor down there. And uh, the chain comes over the bow, and they're on the bow see it's very flat and um, it goes to the windlass which is sticking upright so um, all the ratchet mechanisms are still there um, the the bits and everything else um, and another quick little view of this one again I got down before everybody else that's probably why I'm on the boat is because I did the pictures first we were getting smarter now I'm not trying to do the pictures while everybody's drawing I'm going to take the pictures first and then let everybody draw so and this is what the the scow schooner Alaska looks like so again a lot of this is done by feel because they're um, you know waist deep in this quicksand so Okay, so the last one, does anybody see the shipwreck picture in this? This is, again, going to take some imagination. It's outbound from the beach a little bit. It looks almost like a smear or a thumbprint or that I had a smudge on my camera lens or something. And it's out a little bit further. So, and this took us a little bit of time to find. So Susie, Susie and Mike, we were working with them to try to get more pictures of the shoreline so that we could sort of geo-reference where some of these things were. And, um, and I can just imagine you guys flying and Mike hanging overboard and like, you know, with a GPS or trying to snap pictures, you know, because of course she can't fly the plane, take GPS coordinates and take pictures, you know, I mean, we multitask, but not that much. So um, this ended up being um, a canaler. And so it's a different vessel type. Um, and um, the canalers were a very, very specifically built vessel for the Great Lakes. So these were designed to transit the Welland Canal. So by the hull shape, um, we could tell, and the length uh, and uh, beam on this vessel. So it was 139 feet long, 26 foot beam, 11 foot depth of hold. That is a canaler. You can also tell that it has a very bluff bow, so a very upright bow um, on this vessel. And it probably would have had um, a very sharp turn of the bilge to it. So canalers were also built with a lot of features that, um, that were sort of um, unique to allow more cargo through the Welland Canal locks. These were built to the dimensions of the Welland Canal. So if you could fit your boat in, the more boat you could fit in, the more cargo you could get into the lock and the more money you could make. So the Welland Canal, if you don't know, is the canal that bypasses Niagara Falls. And, um, and so this, uh, this particular ship actually has pins on either side of the bow. And so that would allow you to unstep the bowsprit and you could put block and tackle in the rigging and then be able to cant the bowsprit up. So again, that wouldn't impede um, what you could put in this, this lock 
um, box to get the vessel through. So we started looking through the historical documents and we came up with two vessels that this could be. And the other ones have been easy, right? It's this length, it's in the right spot, we don't know. So this one took a little bit more and uh, because there were two of them. One was called the Tubal Cain, so uh, son of Cain from biblical, yeah. So And, um, and then the, there was another one called LaSalle. And um, it was very, very difficult to, to determine which, because they're all built the same, right? You know, I mean, individual builders have sort of these nuances in their construction, but this, you know, this one, we, we couldn't figure it out. And then I ran across sort of this obscure newspaper clipping that, like, explained in excruciatingly painful detail how the ship was built, like how many nails and how, and it, um, and it went, um, and it went into um, iron knees. And this was very odd because in, you know, when this thing was built, which in 1874, they weren't building vessels with iron knees. Most of them were um, wooden ha hanging knees, and um, these. And so this was like a little bit weird. And so we we hadn't found any other references to when the transition to iron knees happened. But this probably was on the early end of it because it was written up as sort of a novelty. Oh, and it was built with iron knees. And here they are, the iron knees. The other thing you see too is like right um, right along that uh, the uh, timber that goes up the center of the screen there. Um, that's the ceiling planking, so the inside of the hull of the ship. You see those holes that are sort of evenly spaced and going up, those are salt channels. So in this age, they would have uh, created a um, created a brine within the hold, in between the, the outer hull planking and the ceiling planking or the planking on the inside of the ship. And then that was um, believed to pickle the wood so, or preserve it. Um, so this particular ship only was around for a year. So um, it was, um, it sailed up until um, 1875. Uh, and um, in, I think it was November of 1875, it slipped its rudder while off of Twin Rivers Point, Raleigh Point. And um, before they could set anchor, it came aground. Again, they sent tugs. They tried to relieve the vessel um, from the quicksand it was stuck in. Um, and they were unable to, so they, they did some salvage. And um, we did go out and uh, we did a full survey. It's amazingly beautiful. I don't know if you've, you've seen some of the other presentations I've given, but what do you notice in particular, or what don't you notice in particular on this vessel? Muscles. So no muscles. So that's like in 10 feet. You know, I mean, that post, like from the sand to the top of the post, probably eight feet, 10 feet there. So that much sand has moved out of this area because mussels will, will um, colonize on these exposed surfaces in just a season. And we see none that are, that's here. I mean, this looks very, very pristine. So um, kind of crazy. Uh, they took all of the rigging, and um, they, I guess they decided not to salvage it or they tangled it when they started pulling it up. And they balled it all up, and they threw it inside the ship. And, um, and so it, it kind of is there. We couldn't get into the, uh, to the forecastle, so um, uh, up forward to see if there's anything there. But, uh, but I believe if more sand moves, that might be a really cool place to look. And uh, the missing part of the, um, of the port side is probably still buried under the sand there. So everything we do is with volunteers. So we kind of worked our volunteers a lot this year. So we actually had um, uh, four of those last three vessels, we were out, we, we had money, a grant money from University of Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute to look at the SC Baldwin, which is also off Raleigh Point, um, but it's in about 75 feet of water, and so it's sort of away from shore. And uh, for three days of the, of the survey of the SC Baldwin, we had um, really strong winds, which uh, there was a small craft advisory for open water. But because we were inside the point, and because we were so close to shore, we had amazingly flat conditions that were, that were in there. And so we were very fortunate to be able to sneak these surveys in. And, um, and, uh, and Caitlin didn't do a good job with that tape. Yeah, don't notice that. Um, <laughs> so, um, so 
again, maybe I hope you can see why we think this area is so special. There's a huge potential for discovering shipwrecks. I mean, so we, we know of, uh, what, 176 shipwrecks in Wisconsin waters, and there were 750 known losses. So, you know, you have a, a pretty good uh, odds in your favor if you want to take up shipwreck hunting um, and you have a little bit of um, care to be able to do the research to look for some of these, um, you might be pr pretty successful. So, um, our website is uh, wisconsinshipwrecks.org. So um, I'm with State Historical Society, and we're in the Maritime Preservation Program. We run this uh, site jointly with the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute, and they've been our partners for 25 years and uh, of the 28 years of our program. And um, this has uh, information on all of the shipwrecks that I've just shown you and more. Uh, it also has information, or as much as we can find on the 750 losses, uh, we've tried to get all that updated. And the more We're adding information every day onto this thing. Um, it also has information on all of the other maritime features of the state, lighthouses, and historic piers, and uh, anything that we can come up with that we can stick in here to make it more meaningful to everyone. So that's what I have for you tonight. Um, thank you very much.